Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. We've got Sarah Noked with us today. My name is Melissa Dill. I am the COO of the Virtual Savvy and I have completely taken over from Abby. So normally she goes live, <laughs> but I kind of hijacked this live because Sarah is a dear friend of mine and uh, we have a long history. So I get to jump on here with you and we get to chat about OBM week. It is super exciting to have you here with us, Sarah. Introduce yourself. Thank you so much for having me here. So my name is Sarah Noked. Um, I have had the opportunity to come in and out of the virtual savvy community for years now, talking about online business management, which is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so if it works, I'll just go right into the presentation that I have because I have some slides around, you know, who I am and and all that good stuff. Does that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. So I'm just going to present now my screen. Um, so here we go. Okay. Sorry about this. I'm going to start from the beginning of my slides. Okay, so I'm going to share my whole screen. Actually, you know what? Let me stop doing yeah, it's not up yet. So I think... So it's not up yet. Yeah, I don't see it in our um in there our we go. Come out now. Okay, let me add it. And there we are. Okay, great. So here we are um, talking about, and I'm just sharing you guys straight to my Canva because uh, we had to make some quick last minute updates to the slides because one link was wrong. So we're just going to do it right like this. So here we go. So I wanted to come in here today to talk to the community about how you can add OBM services to your virtual assistant services to offer this. Some of you might feel the natural need to make the transition. Some of you might add these along with what you're already offering. And apologies, because my throat's a little bit hoarse today. So <clears throat> I would love to know in the chat where you guys are tuning in from and how long you've been a VA. And I'm going to have a look at that towards the end. I'm going to make sure that I save enough time for Q&A afterwards. So as Melissa, so nicely, you know, introduce me. My name is Sarah Noked. I'm the founder of OBM School and Sarah Noked OBM, which is an OBM agency. Um, basically, I've been an online business manager since 2011. I've worked with hundreds of OBM clients, both in my own agency, as well as through internships with our students. I am very passionate about digital marketing and online business, but my real passion is training OBMs. And much like most of you here today, I also transitioned from being a VA. Um, so if I go all the way back to 2009, that was when I started my VA high, high side hustle while I was still in corporate. Um, in 2012, I was you know, I had I had repositioned myself as an OBM. I was still in my corporate job. In 2013, I left corporate for good, had my first baby, continued to scale, scaled an agency, um, and then I started to train other online business managers um, starting in 2015. And in 2021, we launched OBM School, um, which houses a certification accreditation program, as well as um, an accelerator for OBMs and various other things. So today's agenda, this is not, um, so today's agenda, I want to tell you about our special invite for OBM Week, uh, which is a free event happening um, towards the end of this month. Um, I want to talk about the major differences between VAs and OBMs to give you guys an understanding if it's a role that you want to make a transition into because it's obviously not for everybody. Um, I want to talk about the three most common mistakes that VAs make when they're adding OBM services or making the transition, and then we'll save some time for Q&A. So the big thing here today is um, OBM Week. So I wanted to invite you guys to OBM Week. This is something that is so near and dear to my heart. We have literally been running Confident OBM Week for, I think, like four years. I mean, so I've, I've literally, we try to do it every quarter. We don't always succeed, but we are doing it November 29th, 30th, and December 1st. So this is a totally free event. You can register now at thevirtualsavvy.com forward slash OBM week. 
And we are going to be talking about all the things OBM. And this is going to be incredible for you if you are thinking about making the transition or you're already working as an OBM, because in case you haven't realized it yet, we're always learning and always absorbing new stuff. So this is a really excellent um, challenge for you guys. Now, what is an OBM? So I'd like to just kind of like settle the playing fields here. Um, an OBM works directly with small business owners mostly, and is responsible for managing aspects of the day-to-day -day business activities, aspects, and the team members and the projects. We are essentially the keeper of the business vision and goals. So oftentimes you will see us looking a little bit like this, where we would fit into the um, the business owners, in, in the business in general. So I oftentimes would describe us as being a buffer uh, a buffer between the business owner and the rest of the team. And so sometimes it looks like this one on the top where you have the business owner and then the OBM sort of sits in between the business owner and the rest of the team and all of the information goes and goes up through the OBM and goes to the business owner. That is very traditional OBM styles, but in recent years, and because our online space is naturally becoming a little bit more complicated and more diverse, and there's more team and OBMs and virtual assistants are specializing more, what you will find is that, you know, the business owner might manage aspects, the OBM might manage aspects, you might have other team members, or multiple OBMs on a team, or you might have an ops manager and an OBM and, you know, other kinds of roles. But Mostly the way that I like to look at it is we're sort of the buffer of the information passing between the team to the business owner. So one of the core differences between virtual assistants and online business managers is the actual role. So as online business managers, we are really focused on upholding the client's strategy and vision and making sure that things happen, that things move in motion versus a, a virtual assistant who is really focused on their, their skill set, their, their, um, this, the special sauce that they are offering to their, their clients. So for example, if I'm a virtual assistant that specializes in, in tech, I'm going to get a lot of satisfaction from completing my to-dos and getting things done, whereas the online business manager is more focused on the managerial aspects of thing and making sure that all the parts and pieces are running together nicely. So whereas um, a VA might have a lot of satisfaction checking things off a list, although OBM does as well, the OBM is actually more focused on, you know, are we um, meeting the deadlines? Are we, um, you know, is, are the projects on time? Are things actually moving according to schedule and so on and so forth? Managing the big pieces versus the assistant type role where you're, you know, you're managing what's on your plate for, for the day to day. You're getting a lot of satisfaction out of checking things off. And so when it comes to the skills that an OBM offers, a lot of the time we look at hard skills and soft skills. And when I think about an online business manager, a lot of the hard skills that we, we do as OBMs have to do with systems, operations, project, team, marketing and metrics, and launch. Those are the hard skills. And one of the things that I can't help but emphasize here is that you know, being an online business manager in recent years looks a lot different than how it looked three or four years ago. I'm finding that more and more OBMs are specializing in systems or ops or project management or launch management versus offering all the hard skills. So I, I want to put that out there too, because businesses are really evolving, especially, you know, post pandemic. And of course, we have all the soft skills, which have to do with leadership and accountability and having difficult conversations with your client. Like, no, uh, you know, this launch timeline is not going to work because of X, Y, and Z, you know, and having those difficult conversations, organizing and planning things, decision-making, having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset where you can continuously and constantly learn new skills, learn new tech, learn new SaaS prod, prog, programs and all that stuff. It's really important to embrace 
these soft skills as well, the emotional intelligence and being a really empathetic person, as well as critical thinking. This is sort of what I look at as the, the, the total package of an OBM, but this total package doesn't happen overnight, right? Like this is something that, you know, skills are, skills are learned, um, you know, they evolve. And as you continue to grow a robust business, whether you choose to stay a VA or something else, or you choose to go into OBM, you know, we're constantly evolving. So from a core, the actual um, role is very different, as you can see, because it's assistant versus manager. And as OBMs, you know, we're really focused on managing all of these bigger pieces in our client's business. Now, the second core difference is where our motivation comes from. So as an online business manager, I am very motivated by the client's vision and goals. And as a VA, you might also be very motivated by the client's vision and goals, but you're also very motivated by getting your to-dos done, okay? Whereas as an OBM, we're really, really focused on making sure that things are running smoothly, that goals, you know, we're setting smart goals with our client and making sure that goals are getting met. We're, we're motivated by uh, making sure that we are speaking towards, you know, projects getting completed on time and things moving smoothly. Whereas the motivation, it's like of a, of a VA, it tends to be a little bit more geared towards completing their specific task and less about the whole bigger picture of the business. So I find that for a lot of virtual assistants and myself included, when I was making the transition, one of the things that I noticed about myself was that I was obsessed with knowing what the big picture was. It wasn't enough that, um, you know, that I had the things on my plate that I needed to do. I needed to know, you know, why we were doing them and what the client's intention was and, and what was the strategy behind all of it. I was obsessed with this strategy versus just some of the, some of the natural things that you do as a, as a virtual assistant, you know, the rigor and mole of getting things done and, you know, being, feeling so damn satisfied when your to-do list is done for the day. And obviously, you know, it's the same for an OBM, but we have this, this bigger picture and this sort of bigger accountability around the big picture and what's really motivating us um, towards success in our clients' businesses. Now, the third core difference is the client load and pricing model. And this is one of those ones that, you know, I think is a really important one to discuss because your client load and the way you price your products as, and services as an online business manager is extremely different than when you are a virtual assistant. So, <coughs> excuse me. Well, the main voice today, it's so funny. So when we're a virtual assistant, and I would love to be able to see you guys and to know, maybe you can let me know in the comments. When you're a virtual assistant, I know when I was a virtual assistant, I had eight clients on my roster, okay? And when you're an online business manager, you guys are working with max three to four at a, at a maximum core clients. You might have some project work that you do. You might have, you know, strategy calls that you have with your clients and VIP day, things of that nature. But your client load is three to four clients on your roster. And the pricing model is also very different because you can't afford to take on all of those different clients. You need to really focus on making sure that these three or four clients are really um, where it's at. And it's, it's interesting because the other thing that I will mention about clients is the client itself is so different when you're an online business manager. So I always tell my students and you know whoever will listen, people who are looking to hire support in their business, that every business needs a virtual assistant. I have two incredible virtual assistants on my team. I, I don't know where I would be without them. It's really important to have implementers on your team. And that's not to say that an OBM doesn't implement at all, but you need the core people that are, you know, keeping the wheels in motion, you know, making sure that the tasks are getting the tasks done. And then the OBM who's overseeing how the tasks are getting done. But 
again, you know, this client, when you are at the OBM level, the client has to have recurring revenue. They have to have a proven business model and they have to really have a mindset for delegation. And if they don't have those three qualities, then you are going to be in a situation where you're not going to be able to fully embrace yourself as an OBM on that team because you know, if they run out of finances and they can't afford to keep you on their team, well, you know, very quickly, you're not going to be working on that team anymore. You're not going to have an opportunity to really prove your value as an OBM, and you're going to feel very discouraged in the fallout. So it's extremely important to pick the right client and pick the right pricing model for longevity. So as an example, I wanted you to look at what it looks like at a virtual assistant, typical, you know, maybe you're making $30 an hour, you're billing clients, you're working 80 hours a month, you have six to eight retainer clients. This was me, by the way, uh, when I was in corporate. Um, and I was, you know, you know, six to eight clients, maybe working 10 to 15 hours. It was an 80 hour a month and I was making around 2,400 a month as a virtual assistant or, you know, maybe you're the OBM in disguise where you're working as an OBM to a lot of clients, which is very difficult and you're not charging appropriately. When you're working as an OBM, your price point is closer to the $60 an hour mark because you have more responsibility, more accountability, and you're working more strategically with a client. Um, let's say it's the same workload, 80 hours a month, but you're working with three clients, three businesses to focus on, and maybe you have a, a date, one dating project per month. Um, we call our dating projects, um, you know, just those things that you do to, um, to, to get new clients in your pipeline and to vet out and see if they're a good fit. Because the thing that really does damage to a, to a potential OBM business is when you have four clients on your roster and one client isn't a good fit. And then you're like, oh, buy 25% of my revenue it becomes very, very difficult. So I want you to, to remember that, you know, your, your pricing, you're working with a smaller number of clients at a higher level of value with regard to strategy, accountability, responsibility, the things that you're doing in their business, you're taking more of a stake. Sometimes I, I will even look at being an OBM in someone's business as being a partner of sorts. Um, so we've got a little bit of a, of a testimony around what working with the right clients looks like. So Ashley was um, a, a virtual assistant that transitioned into an OBM role. And a big part of what we talk about um, and what you'll hear more about inside of OBM week was working with stepping stone clients. And when you're making that transition, which is very common for a lot of us, myself included, it's really important to choose the right clients. And choosing the right clients is an art. And, you know, this is this is why it's so important to um, charge a premium price at an OBM level, because first of all, not everybody needs an OBM. But when you do when you do find that OBM client, it is a long term gig. So um, Ashley went from, you know, working what making what she made with in her full time job with just one OBM client and two of the social media management clients that she had from her past VA business that she was running on the side of her full-time job. And that's the other thing that we see, you know, I, I found it difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, but for me, it was difficult for me to leave my corporate job. It wasn't until I started working at the OBM level and charging OBM rates that I was able to leave my corporate job. Okay. That being said, it's not as if um, adding OBM services is just an easy peasy thing that you can do. And ta-da, you've got uh, a really great business or a really great transition model. Um, so what I see, what I see is like I had, I had started getting into this is serving the wrong client. So these are the big mistakes that um, VAs that are transitioning to the OBM role uh, make or even if you're just starting off as an OBM, it's about serving the wrong clients. Not every client needs an OBM. Could every client benefit from the kind of services that we offer? Absolutely, but not everybody needs an OBM. 
the three core characteristics that you need to make sure your clients have are a proven business model, meaning that they are not in the startup mode, no startups, no startups for long-term retainer clients as an OBM. They need to be making a certain amount of revenue. And to me, it's always been at least a, at least a six figure revenue, meaning 10 K a month in gross revenue. Like, so everything before expenses, they need to be making at least $10,000 a month in revenue consistently chopped up over the 12 months in order to merit bringing an OBM on their team. They also have to have a delegation mindset. And unfortunately, this is what we see a lot of in our industry is like, wow, that client totally needs an OBM, but they're still of this mindset that they can only, they're the only ones who can manage their business. And that can be very harmful for an entrepreneur who is scaling. So um, Eben, who recently graduated from our OBM school certification program, uh, wrote, I have, I've, I have experienced terrible clients, or as Sarah calls them, nightmare clients, because I did not take the time to thoroughly vet them and their business. I've learned from Sarah's OBM school program that the boundaries I set in the beginning will save me in the end. And I'm building the business of my dreams and I deserve, and I deserve to, to work with who I choose to work with, right? So Eben is a really great example of how pivoting, because she didn't start from the VA role. She didn't, she wasn't calling herself a VA, but she was coming from a different kind of service support professional type role into the OBM. And it's really important to set very clear boundaries from the beginning in order to have successful relationships. And, you know, they have to have those core characteristics. Uh, another one is Tariro. I realized that the value I was delivering, I was hugely undercharging for my online services. Going through the programs, coaching helped me realize my value, build offers that my ideal clients were ready to say yes to. And now I charge three times my former rates price points I have never, ever charged since I started online seven years ago. I'm so excited because this was just a dream for me and I never thought I could ever achieve this. So, I mean, you know, it's not so easy as just, you know, raising your prices, but you really do need to get clear on who you want to work with and what you're delivering to that client in the OBM space. Because I think one of the things that naturally happens as virtual assistants is we just say yes to everything that comes our way. And if you say yes to everything, you're saying no to yourself in a lot of ways. And you're blocking yourself from moving and evolving as an entrepreneur and as a service support provider. Now, the second mistake that we see um, OBMs make, VAs that are transitioning to the OBM role, is getting into a long-term contract fast, too fast. And it's so interesting because um, inside of... OBM school, we're really big on dating projects. We're really big on strategy sessions and vetting out and making sure that that client is a really good fit. And what I what what feels like happens a lot of the times is we we come from this scarcity mindset where we think, you know what, I I don't want to do the dating project. I don't want to do like a micro commitment project. I don't want to take things slow. I just want to secure this client on a retainer. And as I mentioned at the beginning of today's presentation, when you lose one out of four clients as an OBM, because we usually work with three or four clients, you're losing between 25 to 33% of your revenue overnight. So it, it's so important in the OBM role to make sure that you effectively vet out your clients in a way that you are deciding before you're getting into a long-term retainer because we are really we are really partnering with our clients. We are really in it for the long haul. And so you have to make sure that that client, you know, checks all the boxes. And it's very easy in a 20-minute, you know, discovery call that you might have with that client for you to have the wrong impression or for maybe them to omit all the things that are happening in their business. Um, I did this counterintuitively. Um, I used to do this a lot where, where I used to start working with clients and long-term retainers right off the bat. And then after a month or two, be like, oh my God, this client is not a good fit. 
maybe doesn't even need an OBM. And then I'm saying goodbye to a lot, a big chunk of my revenue. Cause I, I, you know, I, I just can't do, I can't work with a client that I don't feel like I'm genuinely serving. And then I'm back to square one again. So when I was scaling my OBM agency and I had on five full-time employees, it became very apparent to me that if I wasn't going to find the right systems to properly intake good quality clients and know what I'm looking for and have the right systems to onboard them and screen them and and, and test them in a way that I was ultimately um, destined for doom. So I had to get it into high gear fast with making sure that I had systems around vetting clients. Um, and that's a big part of what we teach inside. Now, I've been, I've been talking about these breakthrough strategy dating projects. So here's an example from our group. I had, a, I had my first paid strategy call last night and it was amazing. She said, this is what the client said, I feel lit up, energized, so excited about all the things we can do. Now just getting the project plan in place over the next week, it's super happy with how I broke the ice with this one. And it's so important at the OBM level to have paid strategy calls from the onset with clients and not offer kind of all the bells and whistles in a discovery call that instead of being 20 minutes long goes for 45 minutes, you know, and then you never hear back from the client because they're overwhelmed, right? Now, the big mistake that I see, mistake number three, is ignoring your own business and skills development. Now, I know you guys are all in, you know, Abby's incredible um, community. And so you know that uh, your business and your skills development is so, so important. So I hope that none of you guys are making this mistake, but you have to really remember that we, like, I, I often joke that um, that online years are like dog years in that things move very fast. And sometimes we ignore the natural evolution of developing new skills, whether it be, you know, the skills that I showed you here where you're, um, where you are practicing, you know, your hard skills of, of business management and operations and project and team and metrics and, and launch. And these are all the things that we do inside of accreditation and inside of certification um, is, is, is really, is really working on these hard skills. Uh, of, but that being said, you know, it might be as easy as, um, you know, attending a mastermind event to work on your soft skills or learning a new technology because you've just onboarded a client who uses monday.com instead of, you know, ClickUp or whatever, right? So uh, one of our clients, Dominique, in less than three months after, so she had upgraded from accelerator to certification, I began converting my business to an agency style business, hired a VA, hired social media management for my business and for my clients. Because the big thing about uh, being an OBM is also focusing on your own team growth. And that really goes back to this whole idea of your own business and skills development. Like what about your team? Right. Like, I mean, I remember when I started, I was so I was like gung ho about being a solopreneur, like like to an extreme. I should have I should have noticed that there was something in my in my thought process that was essentially keeping me where I was. But I was like, I don't need a team. I can do this all myself. Like three children later, I'm like, no, you know, so for me, it was all about team all about scaling in, in, in agency, but you you cannot ignore your own need for business development and skills development ongoing, you know, all the time. Um, you know, here's Kelly. I wasn't exactly sure what my what the next steps in my career would be. I ended up being in OBM school and I love it. The more clients that you work with, the more they're going to need certain skills. So keep an eye, keep an open mind because if you're willing to step up to the plate and fulfill the demands of the business you're you're opening up so many possibilities. And this is so true with our OBM clients because, you know, it's it's not natural to come into an online business or an offline business and know all the things and be proficient in all the technology and all the understand how all the funnels work. It really does take time. So the more open minded you are to new skills, new tech, your own business development, the better off you are going to be. And again, We've got our beautiful OBM week coming up.
rounding off to the end of my presentation. So you guys, if you want to join us for this awesome free event, it's happening um, December, November 29th, November 30th, and December 1st. So at the end of this month, um, you can register over at the virtualsavvy.com forward slash OBM week. Um, and if you can't make OBM week for whatever reason, you can also go to serenoked.com forward slash Abby, A-B-B-E-Y dash freebie to download our OBM starter kit. But again, you know, even if you can't make um, OBM week live, we will still be offering a replay for a limited period of time. And literally people get so much value out of attending this event. Like I can't stress it enough. If, if it's, if there's one thing that you're thinking, especially with regard to this slide of like, how can I develop my own business and my skills. Join us for OBM week. It's going to be a blast. We have giveaways. Uh, we have a lot of really fun stuff happening uh, that you do not want to miss. So I'm going to stop sharing now so that I can see you guys or see Melissa. <laughs> hey, Let's hey. See. So I was about to Hey, hey guys. <laughs> I hope my voice wasn't too horsey, <laughs> raspy. No, you did amazing. It was so good. If you guys have questions, make sure that you put a question mark in front. Yes. Drop that in the comments so that we can see that immediately. I'm going to hop in here to you. <clears throat> uh, jump in for the next few minutes and answer some additional questions. This was such a good training, Sarah. I love one of the things that we're, we're constantly doing as um, as we're evolving in, um, in tech and in time or whatever, things change, right? Like it's always changing. So I loved how you outlined too, like what those things were happening. What, what were those things that are happening in the OBM world that are changing? And so that's yes. really interesting. It's so funny because, you know, back in the day I used to always like, cause I, I've been doing this for a dec more than a decade. And there was a point in time where I used to, describe the virtual assistant world as an industry. You know, it's not really a role. It's like this whole big industry and you can specialize in, in so many different aspects, you know, and, but I was like, but an OBM is a role, you know, an OBM, we do X, Y, and Z, but now as this online world evolves, now the OBM space as well is, is becoming an industry where, you know, whether you call it an OBM or an integrator or an ops manager or whatever, it is an industry and OBMs are starting to specialize in launch management, in ops management, in project management specifically, and serving clients with just their specific, you know, or even like a technology, you know, that they, that they love using. Like I have a OBM that I train that like only does click up. Like wants nothing to do with any client that's not using this specific tool. And a few years ago, you'd be like, oh my God, that's insanity. But yeah. that's the world we're, we're moving into now. And, you know, for better or worse, there's a lot more clients in the online space. And that, and for that, a lot more reason and need to really vet out and get the good clients because otherwise it's exhausting. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. We have a couple questions coming in. Yeah. And I know that one of them that came in prior to um, these jumping in is people were wondering, at what point do you know you're ready to make the switch from VA to OBM? And um, I, yeah, that's such a you're good asking that question. It's probably the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're you absolutely know, right. I think like um, one of the things that I've noticed about myself, Melissa, I'm sure you can speak to this as well is like, if there's something happening in your life that makes you feel a little bit out of your comfort zone, or it's like a little bit of a push, a new challenge, then it's really important to hit the ground running and, and start to make those atomic habits, start to make those little actions towards that. You know, building an OBM business doesn't happen overnight. And the other thing that I, I, I didn't mention, but I'm actually making a note, when I transitioned from OBM, uh, from VA to OBM, it took me two, well, actually, no, I did say that in the presentation, it took me two years to make that transition. So if you, if you're thinking about it and it's something that you're like, mm, I would, I would really advise you to start to like look into it, start to, again, find it's, it's about finding the right caliber of client and then being able to offer those services 
you know, whether you are still branding yourself a VA or branding yourself an OBM, the client doesn't care. Only we care about if we're a VA or an OBM and what are the core differences and all these things like your client, they don't care. They just want to know that at the OBM level, you're taking responsibility, responsibility for team, responsibility for projects and deadlines, responsibility for decisions even, because if I know what the vision and the goals are for my client, then I'm going to be able to make decisions on behalf of their business and properly coordinate the team to do X, Y, and Z. So you, there's there's no reason why you can't start doing that now, period. Uh, I totally agree with you. Whenever I was, uh, I started taking the OBM certification. And once I did that, I started realizing, okay, well, things that I'm doing with a client that I'm currently with are OBM tasks. Mm-hmm. It's just like, we, we kind of feel it intricately. It's like, oh, I just, like you mentioned before, I want to know all the things. I need to know all the details about all the things. So if you're one of those people where you want to know all the things and you just naturally find yourself started like collecting the information mm-hmm. And making sure things are happening, like, well, you know what, this this ball would have dropped if I didn't take care of this or this totally. or this. Totally, yeah. or, or being able to say to the client, you know, instead of how can I help you today, you know, in that assistant kind of role, how can I help you? What do you need help with? You know, it, it's just small changes to your language. You know, instead of saying how can I help you, it's you know, I noticed that this ball was about to drop. So I went ahead and took care of that. But now I see a bigger system and an SOP that we need and possibly a new team hire to take over this system. And, you know, suddenly your client is like, wow, what kind of, you know, I even get goosebumps talking about like, what kind of value is that? That's very different from me delegating things to you and you just checking tasks off. And, you know, yes, I mean, it's absolutely an an important role. You always need implementation happening, but there's this level of freedom and time that you give the client back. And that actually speaks towards that, um, that sort of analogy of, um, you know, uh, VAs charging $30 for their, their services versus OBMs charging 60. And those are all just, you know, random numbers. You know, I know that we're all, sometimes people get all up in a hissy about, you know, rates and stuff like that. But it's more about just showing like at the, at the higher OBM rate, the reason why we're charging that higher OBM rate is the, the responsibility. But it's also the fact that, you know, your client is getting back their time because they're not managing their team anymore. They're not keeping an eye on the funnel. They're not coordinating. They're, you know, you've taken some of those managerial pieces off of your client's plate, thus giving them back time. And that is, to me, the most um, groundbreaking thing that we can do as service support providers is is give our clients back more time in that managerial high level sense, because it's, it's, it's exhausting. Like I I often tell um, my students and anyone who will listen that, you know, if you're creating a standard operating procedure for a client, and you're, or you're you're kind of documenting a system or looking you know looking to streamline it. It can take you a good two or three hours to focus and really reel it all in and think critically about it. And we only have two or three good hours in a day to like focus at that level. So you know after that you're kind of like you know you're mush because you can't really think anymore. You've put so much energy into these two or three really solid hours. So. You know, I'm just I'm just making the point that it's it's a different it's a different return on investment than they're getting when they hire a manager versus an assistant for them. And that's what we want to focus on is the client. You know, do they need this kind of service in their business? Because I will tell you, the majority of clients out there need to be their own OBM. Right. And we will see it all the time, you know, with all the love in my heart. Um Clients that are successful despite themselves, clients that are, you know, doing all the things and getting, you know, making great money, but they're not necessarily um, really worthy of of bringing on that OBM team member. They need to just still focus on, um, you know, doing doing all the things and managing their own team. And I find also a lot of the times um, they're just not great at being an OBM and, but, you know, we all have to bootstrap to an extent in our, in our businesses, right. If we're at that stage in the game. So as, as OBMs and OBMs to be, you have to just be very, very strategic on who you work with and you have to say no more than you say yes. 
I think that's a really important point that you bring up is being able to be assertive within the business. So there's yeah. a there is like a mindset shift whenever you go from being a VA to an OBM. Um, there's a question here: struggling with taking a current VA clients who have over delivered with to OBM oh, yeah. without them, yeah. they they get 24 hour access to me. What is oh, typically yeah. the amount of access a client should have to us? That's part of that assertiveness that you need to take. It's like this is what I'm going to deliver to you. This is my value. This is what you're paying for. This is what right. you're getting. You don't get 24 hour access to me. That is yeah. a hard no. You know, know, even as an OBM, I mean, I don't care what you're charging. Right. You know, I mean, even with my family, I have boundaries, you know, and that's (laughs) boundaries are the first thing that you need to set up. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I love this question because my answer is always, you know, maybe it's time to say goodbye to some of those clients, right? Because sometimes you've made your bed, you've set all these loosey goosey boundaries they, you know, you, you've over-delivered. I find sometimes these clients don't even need an OBM per se. Like every business can benefit from, you know, management and streamlining systems and all of these wonderful things that we can do, but not every business can afford that. So I would ask myself, can this business afford an OBM? And if the answer is yes, I would ask myself the question of, you know, is this client um, a lot, do we have aligned values and is it, is this, you know, can I save this? Can I have an open, honest conversation about what I'm experiencing with this client? And if the answer is no, then I would say, I would, I would practice from the perspective of, I'm not, I'm not going to be one to believe that, you know, that clients don't exist. There's lots of clients out there. Every second a client needs an OBM, you know, it's like, there's no shortage of clients. Um, but there is, a level that you've sort of, you know, almost put yourself into a position that you can't get out of. And when I, when I made my transition, I kept all but one client and she is still my, one of my very best business buddies till this day. This is almost a decade later. Um, And she was the only one that I carried over with me because I had done exactly that. I had worked for free with some clients. Like I literally made all, you know, I didn't have Abby's program when I started off as a VA. So I made all the mistakes. I didn't, you know, I I didn't do any of the right things. I started working for free to begin with for testimonial. Um, And, you know, I just, it was very easy for, I'm just, I'm, I'm naturally a people pleaser, you know, recovering people pleaser, but I really struggled with that at the beginning and just, you know, saying yes to all of these things when I should have actually been saying no to begin with. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's, it's okay to walk away from those clients. You have to believe that you can get better, uh, better clients that you can start off with on the right foot. I will say this too. Um, one of the things that I was just so blown away with, with the certification is how it is so step by step. Like this is how you do this. Whenever I came on with Abby, I had already gotten my certification and everything. And I, mm-hmm. I laid out like, this is how I'm going to onboard you as an OB. Right. Like she was just like, huh take my money <laughs> you know, because you have like the systems, you have the processes, you have the, like, I know what we're doing first, second, and third. So before it's like, okay, well, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And like, you know, you tell me like, okay, yeah, I'll work for you, you know, like at, at eight o'clock at night, at nine o'clock at night. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. And so, but with whatever you, need. <laughs> whatever you need, I am here for you. <laughs> I will serve you because we are often are servants. Like we often are. Um, yes, part of like service. Service. yes, absolutely. Yeah. We love helping people mm-hmm. I mean, in every aspect of our lives. But, you know, again, it's like if you're saying yes to something that doesn't serve you, you're saying no to yourself. So no, yes, like you at eight o'clock is saying no. Now I can't put my kids to bed. Mm-hmm. You know now. You know. So it's like you know you have to. You know, there's always a trade off. Um, but when you have, that's why three to four clients. You know, clear boundaries, clear expectations. You know, offering rates that you can, um, you know, really like afford to survive as a business owner, especially in today's age. Right? It's a thing of beauty to me. Yeah. Another one of the questions that um, it, it's definitely tricky is how do you know what the client's revenue is until you actually like join with them and text, until you actually onboard? Whoever's asking this question is a smart cookie. Yeah. I list that in the questionnaire. 
So in, inside of OBM School, we give you all of our all of our systems. You know, we talked about the onboarding, the offboarding, the what to ask before you get on a call. When I am getting on a discovery call with a client, I know what their revenue is because that is a core uh, consideration for me as an OBM as to what I'm going to sell them on at the end of my discovery call. It's very, you know, if they're making um, $3,000 a month, it's going to look very different as if they're making 10000 and I know they have potential for a long-term retainer. If they're, you know, if they're making that 3000 a month and they've got inconsistent revenue, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm unwilling to have a dating, like a dating project, a strategy session, a VIP day with them if they're willing to invest. But I know that I'm not going to want to work with them long-term. As crazy as that sounds, I'm just, I'm not because I know. So you have to ask that in the initial questionnaire. And you can't break your own systems. You have to follow your own systems. You know, if I set this beautiful discovery form to booking a call with me to email, you know, marketing and all this fun stuff in between, you know, I find a lot of the times when I, you know, what I used to do back when I was making all my mistakes, which I still make mistakes, but back mm -hmm. in the day I was doing things like, oh, you know, don't bother filling out my questionnaire. Just here's a link to book a discovery call and trying to get them into retainer services because I was coming from a place of scarcity, honestly and truly, rather than really owning my services, owning my systems and being like, you know what, if you want to work with me, you got to go through my system. We're going to keep it nice and clean, all booked in my CRM. Yes, I've got a CRM. Yes, I've got a website. Yes, I've got all these beautiful things to, you know, push my website forward with my best foot. Because that's also an important thing, right? You know, you like, you know, a core distinction between VA and OBM is like, I can get by as a VA without a website, you know, with, I mean, obviously it's great if I have a website, but I can absolutely, you know, have, have get, get clients without a website, hit the ground running without a dating project, because, you know, I'm offering a very set package of, you know, graphics or, you know, content cues or whatever it is, you know, it's, 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 it's more. Um, it's less, I think, you know, because with OBM, it's so much more strategic and it's so much more about planning and strategic planning than it is about um, offering a specific package. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And this kind of leads into this, too. Um, we touched on it before, but it's also important to make that that distinction. Can they become an OBM if they weren't a VA first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So. <clears throat> there are definitely benefits of having virtual assistant experience before moving into the OBM role, you know, hands down. Um, I, for one, was so much more comfortable with technology. Um, I was, I could do, I could set up a lot of, you know, I could set up my, my own website and my own funnels and my own email marketing stuff because I had that experience. But that being said, you know, as OBMs, we have to build our own business. Like part of what we do in our accelerator program is like, let's build your funnel. Let's build your website. Let's build your SOPs and your system. So you will be your own VA. You, you will get VA experience there, you know, and that's the other thing that we sort of touched on when we were talking about how people try to like dichotomize, if that's even a word, the, the OBM versus the VA. We try to create this clear distinction between the two roles, but you know, there's some overlap, you know, even as an OBM, like I've definitely done VA work. You know, I ran a full scale agency and we used to always factor in like 20% of the work that we do would be like VA level. And we'd have our, we had virtual assistants on our team to like set up the technology and, or do some specific research around tech. So there's always an overlap. It's never black and white is what I'm saying. And so you will get, even if you start off as an OBM right away, you will get the VA experience. If you are coming from VA to OBM, I promise you, you'll, you're, there's no amount of experience that you can get that's going to make you feel like, okay, now I'm ready to like move on to OBM. There are two very different roles. You know, one is, one is like getting, getting the things done and implementing. And the other one's like strategy and more managerial and more, you know, higher level thinking with your client. And it's a different, very different roles. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, it's, it's, I think naturally the VA evolves into the OBM because of the way that our industry has grown, but they're still very distinct things. We have a lot of people in our programs that are coming because they've been laid off from a job where they were a project manager, a team manager, managed budgets, and they had all of this transferable skill, right? Because like, don't discount your transferable skills too. 
Yes. Okay. So I love the fact that you brought that up. So for me, my journey was a lot easier going from VA to OBM. Mm. So I had never worked in the online space. So right. when I came into the online space, there were words that I didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Like It's like, okay, you're speaking English, but I right. think it might as well be Greek because I don't understand what you're saying. Whenever you yeah. talk about funnels and, um, you know, launching and, uh, you know, um, conversion right. rates and all of these. There you go. Yeah. 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 Like click through rates and all this other kind of stuff. It's mm-hmm. like, what are you even talking about right now? So I had no idea what all of those terms meant. So for me going to, um, getting into the, the online space as a virtual assistant, getting my feet wet and then moving into the OBM world was so much easier, but that's not to discredit like where we are today. So whenever I came in many years ago, um, it looks a lot different. So now we're in the pandemic age where so many people were pushed online. And once people were pushed online, some of those terms became a little bit more familiar. Like it used to be nobody knew what I was talking about when I would talk about, you know, doing a Zoom chat or whatever. Now, like your friends, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. your kids are on Zoom now, you know, right. it's, it's so much different from literally just like two years ago. So, so different. you can absolutely come in from just as a person um, in a in a role like like you mentioned, project management, things like that. And just go straight into OBM work, but don't. Um, but if you don't feel like you know you like, I need to tiptoe into that. Going into the VA world is really good. I only spent, gosh, I think I only spent like six months or so in the VA world before I was like, okay, I now I get what's going on. Now I can jump in, and I felt right. so much more comfortable. So it right. just you really have to assess it for yourself. But having the OBM school and having a course that will tell you like this is how you do it is definitely the way to go. Another person asked, um, you know, a lot of people want to hire people with degrees and management and things like that in the uh, brick and mortar space is having right. the OEM school like, like the, like the degree in the online in the physical yeah. space. So one of the, one of the really awesome things about OBM school and our accreditation program is that we have online credentials and these are, these are digital credentials. So in, I, I mentioned those six core skills, project team, all that all that stuff. So inside of our program, we actually have projects that evaluate your understanding of those core skills. And that's why skills development and, you know, confidence comes through doing and all of these really important things, you know, you will get confident by practicing these skills and then be able to offer launch management. So we have digital credentials that are housed and partnered we partnered with credly to house them uh, as digital like it's it's like a digital wallet so on the back end of these credentials is metadata that talks about exactly what you needed to do to get that credential you know like i attended this um uh, we we call them our breakout sessions uh, because we break out and we do different projects and we we have a whole aspect inside of accreditation and our certification program that actually really does help you develop these skills. So from that angle, you know, yes, you can show on, on paper digitally to your client, what you've been doing and how it really does. But I I also think that, and I think this is sort of like a natural thing that happens because I've been in, you and I have been in this industry for a while. Um, You know, and people say to me, you know, do people even know what an OBM is? They say it less these days, but 10 years ago, people used to ask me all the time, do people even know what an OBM is? Well, you know, do do on, offline businesses either even hire OBMs? Most of my clients were offline businesses. They were professionals like real estate agents and um, surveyors and literally very, very much brick and mortar type roles that were, you know, branching off into having social media or running Facebook ads and needing a leg of their business that was running digitally. And that's what we managed for them, that digital part and other various things naturally, as you get into involved in someone's business, but anything that we could do remotely. And most of these corporations and clients who come from the brick and mortar, they know the value of hiring contractors, versus employees as well. So there's there's a lot of perks for them that um, I think really do come to a head and can sort of over, you know, just like it doesn't matter that you don't have a business degree. Um, 
because there's more and more you're going to be seeing these digital credentials like IBM and all these big companies use Credly to train uh, in certain programs and then have these digital badges. So that's that's a whole other world really now. So Sarah, I have to ask you, um, because yes. again, like back in the day, there was like a whole week where it was just project, project, project. Yes. Is it still like that now? Well, you no, know, we actually, so inside of OBM school, we do our own thing. We are not connected to any other. Um, so inside of OBM school, we have, so for example, just before, maybe this is why I don't have a voice. Just before this call, we had a breakout session where we, over the course of six months inside of our program, you have an opportunity to get on breakout sessions with us. We 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 essentially simulate what it feels like to have a client over the six month period, and you're doing various projects. We call them Dylan, Dylan, and you know Morgan's our VA, and there's all of these different scenarios and projects that our students will go through over their six months to be awarded credentials. And then when they have all of the six credentials, then that's when they get awarded with the OBM school certification. So it's not a week of intense exam. It's a natural thing that evolves over your time inside of OBM school uh, oh, because evidence comes through doing. And we really do need to practice these skills. Like, I mean, I'd never launch managed before. Like what's launch management, you know? Like, right. let's, let's do, let's manage a launch together. Let's like lay it out. Let's talk about it. Let's brainstorm together. Let's, you know, and let's feel confident now going into a client's business and being able to do this. And yes, Olivia, there is accountability. Um, there are, you know, we have three mentors in our program in addition to myself. Um, so yes, yeah, all of that stuff. I think it's so important to have that uh, when you're kind of leveling up in this way. I love that that's how the program works. It's so you're you're learning your skills and you're applying them and you're being evaluated. And so it's like little by little. So it's a six month program. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And you're getting feedback too. So it's six months, but there's three projects that are given within the first three months. So you have the whole six months to finish, but most of our students get their accreditation. They get their credentials. They get their certification way before uh, they're done the program because you know, and I, I think that this goes without saying is that, you know, no one's going to build their OBM business in overnight, you know, no one's going to build their VA business overnight. It's like a constant thing, you know, so if you've got six months inside of OBM school, you know, we actually have a continuity program where a lot, a big percentage of our students stay in there because they're scaling agencies or they're growing team. They're like taking it to the next level, you oh, know, right. and That's doing yeah, yeah. Like yeah, because they're doing things that, you know, they, they never would have imagined. Like I like, again, I was so into being a solopreneur that I was like, team, who needs team? Like now I'm like, oh, my God, how do people even run businesses without team? And obviously, this is me after being more than a decade in this industry. But, you know, I want my students and, and our, our community at large to, to be successful, you know, working from home and having the flexibility um, so to me, it's really important to kind of share um, over time that like, you know, it's 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 unrealistic to think that something like this can even six months, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for your time thank today you. and so much. So one more time, the virtual savvy dot com backslash OBM week. If you haven't registered, make sure you sign up. It starts next week. And yeah. um, and it's how long? It's well. It starts on the uh, the the twenty eighth, the 29th, and the first. I'll put the uh, yes, the 29th, We're doing defining the roles and the clients. We're going to be really diving into who is your OBM client, who they need to be. Um, that's eleven a.m. Eastern time on November 29th. On the thirtieth, we're talking about mastering the tech, and this really speaks to the the strategies that we use as OBMs to kind of understand the technology in our clients' business without having to learn everything. And then the third day on December 1st at 11 a.m. is the packaging and the pricing. And we're going to be really pulling back and sharing with you guys a lot of really good information around um, how you can price and package your OBM services so that you are not, um, you know, getting into a situation where you're, you know, offering a ton of service and you don't have any other bandwidth for anything else and you're not meeting your financial goals and you're not able to get to where you want to be. Right. Awesome.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. We appreciate all of you for being with us today. Sarah, thank you for sharing your knowledge because you're always a wealth of knowledge. We're looking forward to that OBM school or OBM week next week and the opening of OBM school. All right, everybody. If you have any more questions, drop them in the comments. We'll check back and we'll answer them. Or ping me. Yeah, you can always reach out to me too, guys. Don't be shy. <laughs> Absolutely. Bye, everyone.